Hi everybody, thanks for joining us. Um, for those of you that know me, my name is Peter Llewellyn. I run the services at medcomsnetworking.com. So information services, resources, activities and so on for people who work in and around medical communications, medical education, medical publishing and associated businesses across the world. Uh, you'll find lots of information um, about all sorts of matters to do with medcoms um, and related businesses. Uh, importantly, there's a number of websites around that. Uh, Network Pharma TV is worth giving a shout out to. We've got hundreds of videos there now, uh, many based on webinars like this, but there's other sorts of video content as well. So Network Pharma TV for hundreds of videos. Um, and also a shout out, anybody who's interested in the business, maybe you want to join as a medical writer or an account manager and so on, uh, you'll find lots of information specifically for you at the first medcoms job com so do go and have a look around um today absolutely delighted we've got our panel of publishers again so this is an annual annual session we run now um it's great to have you all back thank you very much um we're not going to do any slides today we're just having an open free-flowing panel discussion um i'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves say a few words about what's happening at their company and then we will go for um, a discussion hopefully informed by the um, the uh, the audience we have today with their questions and comments. So, without further ado, we're going to go in alphabetical order by surname. Let's get the rules straight to begin with. So, Claire, you're on first. Tell us who you are and tell us a bit about your company. Thanks, Peter. I'm Claire Cook. I'm the senior editor at the Adis Journals, so part of Spring and Nature. Uh, been with the company 15 years in various roles or within journal publishing. Uh, and my role is mostly to kind of oversee the Adis Rapid Plus journals, manage the team of editors and editorial staff, uh, overseeing kind of processes, strategy, business development, um, any kind of wider projects like journal launches or new article launches uh, and those kind of things. So what's been happening at ADIS this year, we launched our summary of research articles at the start of the year, which we now have established guidelines for. So this is our standalone um, summary of a previously published paper written in kind of clear and understandable language. So they're aimed at healthcare professionals. So generally kind of um, non-specialists in the field and time poor clinicians, but open, open access, so available to anyone who would find it useful to have that kind of plain language summary. Um, so it aims to facilitate accessibility, but without oversimplifying the content. They can be written in-house as well by the ADIS medical writers at the discretion of the ADIS editors. Uh, podcast articles, they continue to be increasingly popular. So these are our standalone articles. Uh, they have the, a unique DOI. And they can be a great way to kind of discuss either clinical trial data, conference data, but bringing in a bit more kind of personal experience uh, or opinion. So it can be healthcare professionals or we've had patient speakers, carers, nurses, et cetera. Um, and because they're hosted on the Springlink platform, but because they're podcasts, they're also hosted on Figshare as well as all the kind of podcast platforms. So uh, Spotify, Apple Music, et cetera. So helping to increase dissem dissemination and they're generally fairly well read. Uh, more broadly, AI, I know this is going to be a topic of discussion today. So just briefly, Spring and Nature as a whole has been exploring AI options for a while. So at ADIS, we kind of lucky to benefit from whatever they develop. So some recent developments have been Curie, which is an AI powered writing tool. So particularly to help kind of uh, scientific writers who maybe English isn't the first language. And then Spring and Nature have also recently acquired Slimmer AI. So they have a number of AI tools, but some um, include sort of helping to identify appropriate peer reviewers and helping to detect plagiarism and paper mills, that kind of thing. And then kind of back to ADIS, continuation of uh, our other key services, like our pre-submission inquiry service, which is really popular. So this is where you can send us uh, an abstract or an outline of a paper. We'll get back within two working days with a full list of all the ADIS journals that would consider that research. So by consider, we mean sent to peer review. Uh, we also provide editor feedback uh, prior to peer review to give it the best chance of getting through review. We've actually just done some analysis um, this week into what the rejection rate has been for the papers that have come through the peer, uh, the um, pre-submission inquiry service, and it drops it down to 10% rejection rate this year. Uh, rapid publication and timely publication. And then getting back to conferences this year, which has been great. It's been so nice to get back to seeing authors and, and industry contacts face to face. So then looking ahead to next year, 
more of the same, everything we've just talked about, um, getting back out to conferences. We've got ISMAT EU in January, the next one coming up. Um, we've also just started or restarted our lunch and learn presentations. So this is where the senior editorial team can come either come out in person to your offices as in uh, Medcoms or pharma publication teams, or we can present virtually. I know a lot of hybrid working and work from home now. Uh, and we'll present on a key topic within publishing. So it might be digital features, uh, data dissemination, patient involvement in publications um, and we welcome suggestions of topics that you're interested to hear about and um, we provide lunch as well um, and then finally more AI so more developments is obviously a rapidly evolving field so looking at other ways to improve author uh, services and all of our processes so yeah that's excellent. me thank you excellent lots to talk about in there um, Amish you're next I think on our little list Fantastic. Thanks so much, uh, Peter. Yeah, so my name is Hamish McDougall and I'm the Publishing Solutions Manager at SAGE. So my job is essentially to act as a first point of contact for publications teams from Medcoms agencies and pharmaceutical companies. So any queries at all, including things like pre-submission inquiries or tracking down manuscripts or any special projects, uh, rather than trying to find individual people within SAGE, uh, you can just use me as your point of contact for everything. Um, so I'm particularly interested in improving accessibility and discoverability of medical communications, and that involves everything from digital features such as video abstracts, infographics and podcasts. Um, and I'm also very heavily involved in SAGE's plain language summaries initiatives and was delighted to be part of the team responsible for launching our plain language summaries of publications or standalone PLS article types earlier this year across several titles. Um, so a bit of information about SAGE, uh, we have a very wide selection of journals, so over 250 in the clinical medicine space, uh, from very well-known in-house titles such as the Multiple Sclerosis Journals to large society titles like Kefalalgia. Um, we have a large portfolio of journals with various different publishing solutions, and we facilitate open access publishing across our entire journal portfolio, whether that be through hybrid open access models or gold open access models. We're also very well known for our therapeutic advances journals, which facilitate a very wide selection of publication options, including things like special issues, uh, plain language summaries of publications, and our very open approach to publishing new article types and special projects. So we're very open to hearing new ideas and adapting and being flexible uh, to whatever your needs are as well. Um, and in generally, we pride ourselves as a publisher on being able to provide a very personal touch when working with our clients uh, and our flexibility and ability to adapt to new ideas. Um, we're always on hand throughout the publication process to provide advice and assistance where necessary. So please do get in touch uh, with me if you have any queries at all. Okay. Thanks, Hamish. Uh, Johnny, you're next, yeah? Yeah, thanks very much, Peter. Um, so I'm Jonathan Patience. I'm the Head of Publication Development at Taylor & Francis. Uh, I've been working in medical publishing for about 12 years. Um, and for the past several years, I've been co-leading on Taylor & Francis's Plain Language Summaries Initiative with my colleague, Kelly Solderbin. Uh, so that's something I'm really passionate about and looking forward to seeing how that develops over, over the coming years too. Um, so my team is responsible for liaising with industry publication teams um, to make sure that we're meeting their publication needs. Uh, and that includes discussing specific research out outputs and publication plans. So um, please do get in touch with me if you would like to discuss any upcoming plans or publishing options for your work that includes specific manuscripts. Uh, so I'd love to hear from you on LinkedIn, connect with me, and I can either speak with you directly or, or connect with connect you with someone in my team. Uh, and we can be your go-to person to discuss that and make sure you have the, the right research output for your work. Um, so what's new with Taylor and Francis? Um, well, those paying attention to the publishing news uh, will hopefully have seen that uh, we acquired Future Science Group on Monday this week. So that's obviously huge news for us. Um, it strengthens our existing medical publications and services, especially within the farm space. Um, so we're really excited about working more closely with the Future Science Group team. For me, that's personally also really exciting because I started my career with them and I really rate their, the innovation and their flexible approach to publishing. 
Um, they also have some really high level journals um, and I'm really impressed by their plain language um, summaries and digital hubs um, and all the work they've been doing in that space. Um, the digital hubs in particular focus on sort of research communities, for example, in the oncology space. Um, so I'm really excited about how we can work together um, with Taylor and Francis uh, and Future Science Group. And I think over the next few months, we'll be identifying opportunities um, in that area. Um, so obviously there's lots to come on that, but uh, just uh, conscious of time, I'll, I'll try to cover some of my other points. Uh, so this year we have also been a supporter of Open Pharma and we um, intend to be again next year. Uh, we also have several plain language summary initiatives underway. Um, we launched plain language summaries of publications, also known as PLSPs, uh, earlier this year, and we've got a few in the pipeline. Um, so watch this space. Hopefully you will see them published soon. Uh, we also launched patient perspectives article types on several journals. Um, we've launched uh, plain language specific peer review guidelines, which are now publicly available for anyone to read. So you can check that out on the Taylor and Francis website. And we've been working with other publishers um, such as um, Bacaris, FSG, Sage and Springer, those on this call. Uh, we're on the centralized database for plain language materials and just investigating options there. Uh, we also have a number of initiatives related to patient engagement, um, and we know that's a really important piece of the puzzle. Um, so we have some things underway there, so watch this space for that. Um, we also launched a new series of journals this year called the Elevate series, um, and they really focus on giving a gold standard author service with a really responsive author support. Um, they have fast turnaround times um, with a fast desk decision and the first post peer review decision in 22 days. Um, they offer good value. And uh, a couple of journals that might be interested in, of interest to people listening here would be Annals of Medicine and potentially also All Life. <laughs> We also launched a journal of translational research as part of the Elevate series recently. We partnered with the European Alliance for Social Sciences and Humanities and the European Infrastructure for Translational Medicine to co-convene a research policy workshop on translational research um, to promote interdisciplinary collaboration. So if you're interested uh, in that, you can find the report on our F1000 platform. A few other journal lo launches worth mentioning is uh, we've launched gastrointestinal cancer targets and therapy. Dermato Oncology, Journal of Health Equity and Geriatric Pharmacology. So uh, if you work within those fields, definitely check those out. And we're also now the new publisher of uh, the Journal of Pharmaceutical Policy and Practice. Finally, obviously, uh, artificial intelligence is a, a really big topic this year, and we've been investigating that in a variety of ways. Um, both looking at in our internal efficiencies and workflows, but also looking at uh, what it can be used for in content generation. So, for example, plain language summary generation and um, journal launches in those that area. Um, so, we're actively looking into those and um, keen to understand the needs for those types of services and products. So, if you're if you have interested interest and needs, then get in touch. Then get in touch with me. Um, I'll be happy to discuss those further. We also um, recently published some OA position, uh, AI position statements in our journal Current Medical Research and Opinion. Um, we published an ISMAP, publish, um, ISMAP position statement on AI uh, in CMO recently, and we also have a WAME uh, paper in the works, um, so um, watch out for that too. Uh, we also released a statement in February around responsible use of AI. Um, I'd say the key takeaway from that is that AI should not be listed as an author uh, and where AI tools are used, it needs to be acknowledged transparently. Um, so, yeah, just to close off, just want to say um, with regards to next year, uh, probably more of the same. You'll see you see us developing um, in everything I've mentioned so far, growing those er in those areas. And uh, we will continue to offer our research services, so things like accelerated publication, uh, concierge um, on um, manuscript submission, uh, the service that my, me and my team provide in terms of um, like one to one support on um, sort of pharma or medcoms uh, publications which you want to publish with Taylor and Francis. We can speak to you about those personally, and um, we're also happy to uh, deliver workshops. We've been running some workshops this year with um, various different 
uh, companies and also running our own corporate webinars series, um, which are uh, the recordings are available online. Um, and we hope to run more of those this year. So yeah, very happy to um, continue those conversations. Um, so please do connect with me on LinkedIn and I'd love to discuss any of these further with you. Excellent, thanks, Johnny. And Joe, your turn. Thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, so, um, so I'm the um, co-founder and publishing director at um, Bicaris Publishing. Um, so I've been in publishing for over uh, 20 years and um, most of that time was at my um, previous publisher, which was the um, Future Science Group. So um, Bicaris is um, a, so a small sort of startup publisher. We've only been going since September 2022. We publish um, just the one journal so far, which is um, the Journal of Comparative Effectiveness Research. And we also then have a companion um, digital platform called um, the Evidence Base. So our main focus, uh, we're sort of really Restrict, well, not restricting, we're really focused on um, sort of the health economics and outcomes research space. Um, so our journal, um, JCR, covers that area, as well as sort of real world evidence, real world data, and obviously the comparative effectiveness sort of data. And, you know, we're really seeing um, a, a lot more interest in that um, whole real world evidence space um, sort of this year. So um, this year, JCR has transferred transition to a um, purely open access journal you know there's always a um, you know there's always a worry when you're sort of transitioning transitioning a journal from a subscription model to an open access platform and actually we've seen that it's done really well you know we were worried that submissions might drop off but actually we've seen the opposite and we think we've actually had more submissions so I think that sort of like really underlines that you know everyone's sort of really interested in open access publishing uh, within the journal as well, we're continuing to publish the um, the standalone PLE, PLSPs that I um, established um, at Future Science Group. You know, there's a lot of interest in um, in publishing these. You know, and um, I know as more and more journals as well become available to offer these options, I'm sure that there's going to be so many more of these types of articles available. Which is why, as um, sort of Johnny and Hamish mentioned, you know, we're sort of working as a um, an across um, publisher um, sort of discovery um, project, looking at ways to sort of make a sort of dedicated platform to, to sort of housing these sort of plain language content. At Bicaris as well, we've also um, formed um, a partnership with um, Editage, Editage, which is um, a division of Cactus. So we'll be able to offer all our um, authors sort of, you know, research communication services. So that means sort of complementing their articles with um, infographics, um, video shorts, graphical abstracts, that sort of thing as well. You know, in addition to them providing this type of content, we'll be able to make, um, give, you know, make those authors who just don't have access to sort of creative services the you know the ability to complement their articles and um, with sort of digital features as well um so for me um the past year has been i think you know it's absolutely um flown by um as everyone else has mentioned you know there's sort of two well two main things that i think that we've had to sort of tackle AI, as everyone has mentioned, has been has been the main thing. You know how we, you know do we include AI as a co-author, which we don't, and you know all the different sort of like policies that are you know keep evolving to try and make sure that our you know the journal um, you know keeps up to date with everything, and how you know how it, AI can be used as as a tool in medical publishing, and you know I think it has its place, but I think it's also still growing and it's still not sort of you know set in stone at the moment, and that's where sort of the ISMAP position position papers will sort of help guide this as well. And another thing that we've seen as well is sort of peer review. Um, I think uh, I'm sure the others agree. We've sort of getting a bit of review reviewer fatigue at the minute. Um, you know, this authors are going back to conferences, they're writing papers, and I think just that their capacity to peer review is just sort of lessened slightly as well. So um, at Bicaris and the journal and JCR, we're exploring new ways to sort of um, incentivize reviewers to sort of make sure that the reviews that they return are, are, ti are timely. Um, and this includes sort of, we're sort of, you know, trialing sort of honorarium or even charitable donations on their behalf. It seems to be doing so well so far, um, but whether it's sustainable, um, because obviously there's an admin and, so, you know, there's a lot of admin involved in that. And also it needs to be, you know, completely transparent as well. Um, so this is just something to watch, but it's definitely something that we're trialing and, um, and have been um, experimenting with. And then next year, um, well, we've got a lot of developments in sort of aligning more our um, website, the evidence base and the journal as well. We're sort of bringing them, to, them together in one platform. And we're also potentially looking at new journal launches. But that's something that we can't discuss quite yet. <laughs> OK, thanks. 
Excellent. Thanks. OK, well, we covered a lot of ground there. Um, so, look, let's get some ground rules set up. Um, we're going to talk for the next, um, I don't know, maybe 25, 20, 25 minutes or so. Um, members of the audience that are with us today, please um, ask questions, share observations and comments. We'll build that into the conversation. And um, we've had some quite specific questions coming in for individuals. Uh, what I'll just say as a general point is um, everyone here, they're the right people to talk to at their publishing companies. That's the whole point of this exercise, okay? So um, I think actually you all said that. So if anyone's interested in following up individually, please do. LinkedIn's an easy way of doing it. Um, and, and on that basis, I'll probably not be covering some of the very specific questions that come in. But do talk to each other. Do follow up via LinkedIn and and, and, and so on and make the contacts. Again, I emphasize these um, these panelists are the right people to be talking to. That's the, the beauty of this session each year, okay? Um, we did cover a lot of ground there. Interesting how much you've all talked about plain language summaries already and plain language um, activity and so on. Um, I want to come back to that. AI, obviously, you all highlighted again. We'll come back to that. I, wa I want to start um, with what Joe was talking about, about the peer review. And I know this is an area that we've all, that everyone's sort of um, thinking about at the moment. Um, but Joe, perhaps you can just sort of kick us off, although I guess you've already started, but kick us off a little bit. Um, you've you've um, said that you're looking at how you're working with peer reviewers, incentivizing them and so on. Perhaps you can just take us a little bit further and then we'll get the others to comment on what they're doing at their companies. Um, yeah, so, um, I mean, I think it's not so much the finding the peer reviewers that is an issue with peer review. I think, you know, there's a lot of, you, there's different ways that you can find peer review. Definitely not through chat gpt because that i did that earlier in this year i thought that's it chat gpt is going to solve peer review just you know ask find me 10 reviewers for a paper give it a title and it made up people that oh, right. they sounded okay. very <laughs> le legit and they just made them up so that's definitely not that you know cross that one off that's not going to solve peer review but i think that um so we know at Bicaris we were exploring different ways just to make sure that peer review was just a bit more efficient you know we had a few papers that were in backlog we were trying to sort of make sure that they were sort of trying to, you know, we want authors to publish quickly, you know, that, that, you know, we want them to achieve, achieve that goal. We don't want it sitting around for like six months. And we were finding that, you know, we could, we'd ask, you know, sort of maybe 40, 50, 60 reviewers to review a paper. And it's not that they didn't want to, they just did not have the time. So we thought, why not maybe give them a bit of an incentive to try and do that on time? You know, if we found that when we would, we, you know, we're through the, when we do plain language summaries of publications, we uh, pay the peer reviewers because many of them are patients. We want to compensate them because we feel it's valid. When we thought, well, why not do that the same for peer reviewers? You know, they don't have to peer review. I mean, it is a part of the sort of ecosystem of publishing that peer reviewers have to peer review, but they don't necessarily have to. So I think that, um, we, you know, we just, we've just been experimenting it and we've got, had some really good feedback. People like having that small honorarium and also people really appreciate a charitable donation on their behalf you know quite often they choose that as well and i think that it's their way of sort of you know they they've been they feel a bit more valued rather than just saying please can you peer review and then that's it but i think it's okay. it's it's not it's you know we have one journal i can't imagine how it could be done for right. sort of exactly. three thousand journals <laughs> you know it's just, just, just out yeah. of interest and just to lay the groundwork as it were and bring the others in in a second but as you say you've got a small a small community you're dealing with essentially but just in terms of your ground rules you offer a payment and then they give you your peer review and they get the payment is that the way it works that's and right not being funny be... about it, but if they don't deliver or they don't deliver what you want then I mean, there's a there's a bit of a an area in there, presumably. Yeah, that's some, the thing. Uh... Yeah, that's that's the, that's the sort of grayish, and we've not had that at the minute. Right. You know, once they, you know, maybe they've had a couple of days leeway here and there where they've not provided a timely, timely peer review, or or you know, we've but but because we have such a small community, you know, the H E O R people, experts that we work with, are very, um, you know, they like to peer review each other's work. So I think it, it's worked quite well, and they've been quite, you know. Uh, you know, agreeable to the terms that we've offered them but you know it's not to say that we're going to get a few odd people who don't agree and then okay. we'll have to down, ha, you know we'll have to deal with that <laughs> okay but it's worked for you and this is a long-standing problem isn't it I mean, we've we've often talked about the problems of peer review and finding people with the time and, and, and so on to do um so but i think this is the first time i've heard you talking about paying them um or, or exploring those sorts of options i may be wrong but that's the first time i remember us talking specifically about that jo um i don't know who jo johnny have you got some views on this i mean you've got a much 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 bigger crowd of people yeah. out there to deal with yeah it's a it's a good point and i think Joe is a good point that it's 
I think Tony France is about two and a half thousand journals, so it's quite difficult to 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 do something like that at scale. Um, but we have been looking at we do sort of we have been experiencing the same issues with with um, not yeah not necessarily finding peer reviewers, but uh, reviewers just having the time to agree and and being able to dedicate that. I think they're under increased pressure to publish and to peer review and. Um, we are seeing increased um, increased levels of research output from all over the world. So they receive more and more invitations to peer review for different journals. So there's, um, you know, how do they choose which ones they accept and which ones they decline? And really it has to be, I think often it tends to be the case of the ones that are most aligned with their interests, uh, they're interested in, and they like to have the opportunity to sort of preview some of that work before it comes out potentially. Um, so I think that, um, it is, a, it is a real challenge. Uh, some of the things that we've been doing in the past is we've experimented with a few different kinds of incentives, um, things like uh, like giving free access to um, journals for reviewers for agreeing to review. Um, when we have uh, ex our accelerated publication service in order to turn around reviews quickly, um, there is an honor area that's offered for that. Um, we also um, have been working quite hard in reviewer training. So we have a team who works um, in training reviewers and they do webinars with uh, universities and institutions all over the world um, to help train reviewers um, in how to review well. And so basically trying to kind of um, help early earlier career researchers kind of develop those skills and help to kind of build up the reviewer pool for people who really would like those opportunities to review and to be able to review it well so we have a training program and we have kind of a certified trained reviewers that we invite to review certain papers too um but yeah I, th I think there's always more that can be done and i think um we are also investigating some some other initiatives as pilots um to see how else we can better intensify reviewers and, and recognize them for the work. Okay, okay. Just sticking with this specific topic for a moment, Claire, what, what are you doing at AIDS in terms of incentivizing your peer reviewers? Yeah, so we don't currently pay any of our reviewers at ADIS. Other areas of Springer Nature do. Um, we've talked about it. Uh, we don't for a number of reasons, some of which you touched upon, Joe, like the admin side of it, but also determining what a quality review is. You know, you often get a review mm. that just says, yes, accept. You know, is that worthy of payment? Are we going to get into the debate with the reviewers about that? Um so we have other incentives. So we have things like um, if they're on the editorial board, they're entitled to uh, two free publications per year because there's obviously a fee for the rapid service that we provide. Um, and then on the advisory board, which are, is more of the like day-to-day -day reviewers, if they re um, carry out five what we call quality reviews again it's a kind of bit subjective maybe but five quality reviews within a year they're entitled to a free publication which obviously has to go through peer review there's no guarantee of publication um so yeah they're the main things we do at the moment i mean we are developing tools within spring and nature to help with reviewer identification but like you said we've all said it's not so much the finding of the reviewers it's the time it takes and you know the increasing number of publications and content out there okay and hamish i just want to finish this this specific question with yourself as well, just get the um, the situation at Sage. What do you do in terms of incentivizing? Absolutely, and uh, and yeah, no, I think you know I can sort of you know mirror a lot of the comments that have been made already. But um, I think a lot of the solutions that we've explored have been quite similar. Uh, one thing I don't think we've mentioned is is Publons, but uh, it's a platform that essentially um, exists to uh, credit people who do regularly review and sort of you know actually sort of put a mark on their profile and say, okay, this is somebody that does. Uh, regularly we contribute to, to peer review and then is an active part of the academic community uh, so that, that they are a platform that we've partnered with um, but I think yeah ultimately the, the key word is, is incentivizing uh, so we have looked at things like um, APC waivers on our open access journals and things like that for regular reviewers in the past as well uh, we have explored uh, the idea of paid uh, peer review and, and for especially in our plain language a summary space that is something where we do have to pay um, our patient reviewers because we do feel like they they do sort of warrant a conversation with their time uh, and we have had some discussions and some trial around sort of paying peer reviewers but uh, obviously you know being a sort of a, a thousand journal company and uh, it's sort of having 200 plus uh, medical journals it does sort of get into uh, challenging territory sort of looking at paying you know hundreds of thousands of reviewers a year um, just particularly on the admin side as well. 
just and 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 okay so that, that, that's great thank you very much and it's just interesting to hear the sort of issues that you're facing but um hamish let's just pick up on a point you made but I mean, everyone's making the same sorts of points but i'm going to follow what you you said with uh, hamish in terms of paying your patient reviewers particularly around pls so let's just open up that discussion a little bit in terms of the role of patient reviewers I mean, again, I mean, when people talk about peer review, they tend not to think about patients. So let's just talk a little bit about patient reviewers in this process. Again, questions like how are you finding them? Can you find them? Do you pay them? And so on. You're all, you're all implying that with those as a group, you would probably pay more more willingly than others. But how do you find them in the first place? And how does that process work? How do you find patients as reviewers? How much training do they need? How enthusiastic are they? Amish, just take that for a minute and see where it goes. Sure. And I'm, yeah, I'm very happy to, uh, to answer this question. And unfortunately, like a lot of the work has been done already around this. A lot of guidelines have been set up. Um, and I think, you know, patient advocacy groups have been a fantastic place to kind of go out uh, and, and sort of speak to people. And uh, there are sort of a lot of patient advocates who are very heavily involved in uh, medical research, uh, some, you know, who will all be sort of very familiar with and likely all working with. Um, and they also are able to sort of recommend um, additional patients within their communities who are sort of very familiar with the literature. Uh, I think one of the keys for us when we are identifying reviewers is having sort of a very wide pool because um, ultimately we're asking our patient reviewers to review the plain language elements. Uh, and one of the tricky things is, is that um, patients are becoming increasingly very educated. So when we are looking at patient reviewers, we are looking at patient reviewers outside of their specific condition. Um, I mean, you know, patients uh, in rare diseases are far more familiar than sort of most doctors about what's going on in their disease. So uh, it is sort of having sort of a very wide pool um, and sort of making sure that they are able to sort of review the plain language elements um, specifically. Jay, Jay, do you want to come in on this one? What's your experience of working with the patient reviewers on the PLS side? Yeah, I think you can get you can get two types of patient reviewers for the for PLS, especially for the standalone PLSPs. You can get the sort of the, the patient reviewers who you who perhaps have done have authored papers. Um, you know, you know, not not necessarily P PLSPs, but have, have some sort of author types of articles, and you can ask them to review a paper, a PLSP, because they are familiar with the topic. They'll know sort of, you know, they can review it to make sure that it, what is being said is relevant for their community. But you can also, you've also then have, there's a now, uh, you know, a, a raft of sort of plain language of patients who are now also experts in writing in plain language. So you could get them to review the PLSPs. For just basically for the plain language principles, does it follow all those different principles? You know, active voice, that sort of thing. And is it clear? Is it readable? Because you know, because you know, you know, when I was at FSG, and I know FSGs, you know, published more than a hundred of these now, and, and often the same reviewers will be used, you know, again and again. So they now have a lot of experience in reviewing these types of article you know what to look for they can even suggest ideas for different ways to represent some of the data you know visually that sort of thing so i think there's you know there's different ways that you can um you can work with sort of you know patient reviewers as well and more and more of them are now becoming authors themselves so they're familiar with the publishing process i think that's also useful is to know you know what 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 the peer review means in the context of, of an article that sort of thing and what they're looking for so i think it's um it's definitely evolving on, on that point, let's let's go that direction. Patient authors, I mean, I think you just said, and I would have said, and I think most people nod their heads. But is there any sort of numbers behind it? You know, uh, there are more patient authors nowadays than there used to be. But have you got any? Is there any sense of can you can anyone give me a bit of a context on that? I think you can not. find patient authors. I think so. There's a there's a, a tagging system that we've now started to use, which is um fairly standard across publishers, uh, which is to um for a patient author to list their institution as a patient author, and then uh, with us associated with perhaps the city where they live, or they can also identify oh, other that. institutions that they work at. So if you want to identify if you know if if that's being used consistently and i believe most of us in this call as publishers we are are, are seeing that that is used um you should be able to find it on pubmed so you should be able to search by institution and search for patient author and hopefully be able to find all the manuscripts which have uh, included a patient author yeah okay, we're seeing that's, it that's interesting i didn't know that 
Unless. Increasing in numbers, definitely, and across different article types as well. So, I mean, we launched sort of patient physician perspective articles a few years ago. So, and at that time, that was pretty much our only article type that had patient authors. Whereas now we're seeing patient authors on original research articles, or podcast articles, uh, all article types, really. So, yeah, I mean, exact numbers, I could go and have a look, but definitely on the on the up. I think the main okay, thing okay. as well is that they have to meet that sort of ICMJ criteria. Yeah. So I think, and I think now as well, as because, well, you know, pharma companies are now involving uh, patients, you know, in the steering committees for clinical trials. So I think, you know, that's still in an early stage, but I think, you know, in, in a few years, it could be that patient authors will be the main author, you know, some of the authors on actually, you know, your big phase three clinical trials, um, you know, because there's, there's patient involvement in, in research is just becoming more, uh, you know, it's just, is, is evolving. So, you know, it'd be interesting to see, um, you know, maybe in a few years time, any gem will have a, you know, a patient author on a, on a phase three clinical study that, you know, that would be really nice to see, I think. Well, I mean, as an observer, it, it seems to me that everyone's going in the same direction on this one. You know, the, yeah, everyone approves of the idea of patient involvement and we're, we're heading in that direction. I mean, I'm being a bit simplistic, but we'd all agree on that. Yeah, and there's no, there's no there's no resistance in the system. It's just a slow process getting there. Is that right? Absolutely. And just uh, further to Jay's point as well, uh, I can't recommend enough the, uh, the the resource patientauthorship.com that's been developed by Envision. Um, so for anyone looking to involve uh, patient authors, it really is a fantastic guide. Um, and I think it's it's always worth uh, taking a look at that. OK, OK. Let's just spend a couple of minutes on PLS because we could spend the entire next hour on PLS. But let's just let's just. We're going to have to be it quick because I can, I can see we're going to start. This conversation is going to, going to go on longer than we've got time for. Um, and I still want to talk about AI. OK, guys, we're going to have to get that in the end. So but PLS, let's just talk a little bit about PLS. Claire, I'm going to ask you to kick it off, actually, because you are, uh, your terminology is a little bit different, isn't there? Yeah. Let's, let's start there and go see where we go from there. Yeah, so our, our standalone summaries are called summary of research articles. We do publish like the PLS abstracts, uh, which, you know, the plain language summary abstract alongside a standard abstract within a paper. But our standalone summaries of previously published papers are called summary of research articles. And they're a little different to, I think, the others, uh, the other publishers here in that we are primarily targeting healthcare professionals. So we're not primarily targeting uh, patients. Obviously, as I said, they're open access, so well-informed pa patients can access the content in the same way that they can with any open access content. Um, but yeah, they're primarily targeted at like, non-specialist, um, time-poor healthcare professionals. And I mean, we've had examples, at the moment we've vet we're closely vetting them all that come in to assess the language. We've had some that are oversimplified so we've gone back and worked with the authors you know if it's just a sentence here and there some that, that go the other way and have sentences that are too jargon filled but we'll try and work with the authors if the basis is there to make sure that the level of language is hard because that's obviously the really subjective part of what is plain language um so so we work with them initially and then they'll be reviewed by we have some patient reviewers but alongside standard reviewers checking the the science as well I, I always had the same problem, and I might as well bring it up, but people will be bored of me saying this, that when we're talking about anything to do with PLS, we get a bit confused or people get a bit confused because they're, oh, are we all talking about the same thing? And it's interesting that you're carefully phrasing your discussion about the the papers as opposed to summaries as being for healthcare professionals. Joe, this, I mean, this is your area of expertise, so talk a little bit to this problem I have, which is that if people talk about plain language summaries or publications, they might be talking about something specific for a patient. They might be talking about something for a, a healthcare professional, a more generalist. They might be talking about this magic sort of something that's just more accessible to everybody. And I never know quite how that works in practice because you've got to pitch it sort of in a certain direction. I'm being a bit whatever about this, but just talk a little bit to that one because I do think it confuses a lot of people. It, it does, but I think you need to think about them, not necessarily who they're for, but how they're written. So they are... It's, it's just a plain language summary so it's not it's not necessarily for patients for hcp it's just an, a summary of an article written in plain language in plainer lang plainer language so that you know it's not as, as claire was saying you know it's not full of jargon it's you know it's used in short sentences active voice which is just easier to read you know most scientific articles are written in passive voice which is really difficult to often difficult to read you know the sentences go on for like you know 100 words almost um so i think it's just you know short sentences it's just they're just really easier to read so and that could then mean that that research can then be understood by patients but also by 
you know, by researchers themselves. You know, it could be that you've got health economists, economists wanting to know about multiple sclerosis because they're doing research in that particular field. So they could read the different plain, you know, plain language summaries of that area just to get themselves familiar with that that research. So I think you need to think about it more more about how the article, how, what it is, rather than who it's for. I think that makes sense. It's the format of them as well. I, yeah. I agree. You know, with we can add a lot more graphics or, um, you know, some of the, the kind of more accessible, nicer uh, SROs that we've published so far have been purely graphic based, you know, with a bit of text in just to make the content really easily and quickly understood, whereas you can't necessarily do that with a standard article. OK, so my question, again, I've said this before in situations like this, but to you as a group of publishers, why don't you just insist that the first article is published in the more accessible, plainer language version? Why do we go through this process of publishing something that you more or less are admitting isn't very accessible and then go through a process of, of, of redoing it? I just, well, well, Hamish, go on, run with it. I, I'm, I know I'm being slightly, again, derogative, but what's your answer yeah. to that? Because I think it's a reasonable question from most people's points of view. It's a, it's a very reasonable question, um, but I think, you know, there are there are some things that uh, do require uh, certain levels of technical language, but I, I do think there is a, an element of, um, you know, we could do away with a lot of sort of, you know, some of the non-plain language, and I think it's, you know, it's really sort of, um, we, we've, we've developed this kind of habit of gatekeeping science, and I don't think uh, a lot of it is necessary. I mean, there are certain things, you know, for example, if you're working in oncology and you're talking about certain mutations, and, and they do require sort of specific descriptive language um, but you know when we get into plain language summaries we are still able to break those down um, so I think you know it's a very interesting question um, not one that I have a definitive answer <laughs> for um, but, but okay. this is where, um, maybe it's one this is where AI could come in though you could be you know you should be well, able to exactly. toggle okay, can yeah. you read it in the original yeah. language mm -hmm. or read it in plain language you know that's the that could Absolutely. be the ultimate that could be the ultimate goal <laughs> I, I just on, Johnny, just just pick up on this a bit because I think that's that's exactly the lead into AI that I was following, sort of thing. Why? And, and it seems like there's a huge opportunity for AI to represent information. So, um, and there's a lot of discussion around this in our business has been all year. Do you just put an AI tool on the front or or, or something, or, or just use AI to reproduce these these um, articles in different different languages and different whatever? Just run with it, Louis. I, let's open this up for a yeah. few minutes to so the whole. <laughs> whole topic of AI, which we're not going to cover in five minutes. <laughs> I definitely think that there is a lot of potential for AI in plain language summary generation. Um, I reviewed plain language summaries of, in a number of different projects of, um, of research and reviewed the different tools involved. And I think it's very interesting to see the, the differences in output by tool. Some are much better than others. Um, I would say that my kind of conclusion from having done some of that work is um, probably that AI can actually, and actually is quite good at summarizing research in plain language, but it can also miss key points and it can also misrepresent the facts. So it may misread something uh, and then interpret that in a completely different way way from what it was intended and then basically state that as a fact so there are definite dangers and risks so i would say certainly we're not at the stage where we'd be able to do it without any sort of human human intervention or verification uh, at some stage but i definitely think as kind of a uh, creation of the first draft of um a plain language summary which is then fact checks and made sure that the inter the representation of that work is accurate and not misleading um, but there is also another point which is that around copyright and well it's around um, not just copyright but also confidentiality which is that if you're putting your work into large language models essentially you're uploading it to you know almost like a big database uh, and if you're putting in that work that might not be published yet um, then you're potentially breaching the your company's confidentiality agreements that you may have uh, for the work that you're working with so it's quite risky i think to be putting that into uh, an llm 
Uh, so that's one side of it, that's prior to publication. Um, and post-publication, there's also issues around copyright infringement, which another a number of publishers are looking into. And, and I think that isn't quite resolved yet. I think it's quite a complicated like legal question of whether copyright is being infringed and what that looks like. And uh, I leave that to, to the legal team to investigate. But I think it is, yeah, it's quite complicated. So, that, so it's not quite as simple as we just put it in this tool. I think you need to think about like, who else is accessing that tool, where that data is stored, uh, how publicly available everything is. It's interesting, just uh, the point you, you said early on, something about um, different tools are producing different results. I mean, I, I would strongly argue that a tool can produce very different results depending on the skill of the person that's using it. And I think, again, we've just got to be careful in this sort of a very brief discussion that we've, you know, there's a lot of nuance to this, a lot of different approaches, a lot of things to think about. But, you know, people are becoming, some people are becoming very skilled at using any of the tools. And there are many tools out there to do different things. Yeah. So it's not a question that tool one is good at this, tool two is bad at this. It's a question of how we use the tools. I think there's a different sort of um, way of thinking in there. And um, one of the things, um, I, I mean, I can't remember who said it, sorry, but I, I don't know who said it. So someone just put their hand up and um, was, was talking about, I think it might have been Claire actually, but um, talking about AI tools um, and and providing AI tools to writers maybe where English isn't the the the, the native language and so on. And that's perhaps a slightly different and, and an interesting angle on, on use of AI. Do you want to say a few words? It was Claire, wasn't it, that was talking about that? Yeah, it was. It's a spring of nature uh, tool. I haven't used it personally, so I can tell you what I know, but I can certainly find out more. But it's, it's, it's launched, it's out there kind of in the public domain. It's called Curie. So it's just to aid with the writing. Um, so I guess that's slightly different in terms of can you spell, spell that, Clary? Oh, How sorry. are you spelling it? Uh, yeah, C-U-R-I-E, as in Marie Curie. Okay, um, so, yeah, I think it's slightly different in terms of what we're talking about because we, like Jonathan said, we have to be conscious of uh, confidentiality so we as publishers if we're you know if we're given a um an article that hasn't yet been published we can't really be putting that into chat gpt for example because it's it's confidential whereas this would be the authors themselves they have the rights to to their work and the tool i, I can't tell exactly how the tool works um but you know that's it would fine, assist with fine. the writing but it's an interesting and it's an interesting different angle on this and again if we you know we have to just at least touch on the fact there's lots of different angles to this sort of thing um one of the so so that effectively and simplistically, you're encouraging authors or certain group of authors to use AI tools. Yeah. We're very clear. We've made someone made the point very clearly early on. It is not OK to have an AI tool, chat GPT as an author. That's been sort of like clearly discussed. But using AI, this contention around whether you encourage people or ban people, you're actually pursuing a line where in some cases, at least it's useful to do that yeah and um, has anybody else got a comment on whether sorry i'm going to keep moving this around we're going to run out of time um how much guidance do you offer uh, just a very simple practical question is are you building into guidance to authors any comment about whether you do or don't use ai tools you see what i'm saying has anyone got a simple answer to that hamish you look like you're going to say something yeah, I think I think we provided um, some guidance around it and obviously things like, you know, not having it as an author. But I think one of the things, especially when we're dealing with generative AI, is to caution people that as while it is a fantastic tool and great at things like pastiche for generating uh, plain language summaries, there are a, a lot of issues. And, and one of them in, in particular is, is sort of objectivity and bias. Um, obviously, LLMs are trained on papers that do contain bias and, and LLMs aren't able to sort of um to determine those so um so sometimes you know you may be getting a uh, sort of a very you, you, some of those biases may fall into papers as well and we have to be sort of very cautious of those um, and obviously we have discussed things like accuracy and hallucinations as well um so while they are very very useful tools uh, our guidelines have to stress and they have to say you know you need to be conscious of these there needs to be a, a heavy level of human verification just so that we are making sure that these things don't actually sort of taint the, the quality of the papers. Okay, and John, thing, from your, oh, sorry, well, Joe, go on. Go uh, on just go. another thing, just from, a, from a, a, a writing point of view, I mean, I think they, you know, they can be really used to enhance 
to enhance writing you know everybody who gets you know writer's block or doesn't know where to start so you could use it as a starting point for like maybe you know some background information or you know suggest a title you know even just suggesting a title for a paper you could come up because that you know everybody knows that the title is you know you need to have a really good title for an article so you could even you know you could even you could write a really boring title in chat GPT and ask, I mean, there's no proprietary information there, ask it to come up with a more creative title. I mean, even so just to really sort of like support people when they're writing, I think that is where the real advantage of these tools lies, not, ne you know, not necessarily for creating new content or anything like that, but just really using it as, you know, almost like, you know, you could always have it akin to spell check, <laughs> grammar, you know, Grammarly or something like that, just to be able to really sort of help make things clearer, you know, and also then ha can help with, you know, writing in active voice, short sentences, that sort of thing, just to really help make content clearer. That's where I see the real advantage of these tools is. And to be honest, I write quite some content for our website and I always use chat GPT to help me sort of like, you know, just start off, you know, even like a little short paragraph or, you know, I, have to, I rewrite it always, but just as a little starting point, I think it's just so helpful. I, want, I guess what I'm trying to get at, and Johnny, have you got a comment? I mean, if you're, it's interesting to me that people are wrestling over this idea of how to put specific guidance into, or specific words into the guidance. If we're all saying it's just a tool, we don't talk about all the other tools people can or can't use. And yet we feel driven to be saying something about the AI tools. I just find that interesting. I don't know, I suspect it'll end up getting flushed out of the system, but you know, I'm just intrigued about how much you're putting in specific guidance at the moment about something that we're all sort of saying, well, it's just a tool anyway. But Johnny, what's, what's the situation at, at your end? Yeah, I mean, it's, so Taylor and Francis released a statement in February, uh, so shortly after ChatGPT became, you know, came out, became very popular, uh, basically stating the, the sort of some some considerations that authors need to take if they are going to be using those tools. Uh, we've already covered the fact that they shouldn't be used as an author, considered as an author, um, and ultimately the researcher bears the responsibility for the work. Um, and I think we also say that uh, if you are going to use AI, then there needs to be it needs to be transparent. It needs to be fully acknowledged exactly what you've done and how you've used it and what tool you've used. Um, so I don't. I can't really comment on how that might evolve because I think at the moment there are some quite complex factors in play. I've called them on the copyright infringement, for example. So, you know, publishers at the moment are fairly kind of uh, broad. They're not sort of necessarily saying you should do this or you shouldn't do this. They acknowledge that they can be useful and acknowledge that if you are going to be doing it, these are the considerations that you need to take into account. I don't know whether as those kind of um, those investigations continue, whether the things might change one way or another, whether they actually start saying, actually, maybe these they have these agreements with LLMs and, and, and now we're saying it's OK. Or maybe actually know that this this isn't really something that people should be using because there's all these other le complex legal um, cases at play. So I think I'm afraid I can't really comment on where it might go in the future. Okay. I think at the moment okay. it's... Okay. In fairness, we're probably we've run out of time, so we should draw. Uh, there's so much more I'd like to be talking about, guys. Okay, um, I'm, I'm uh, but I'm going to draw the line for the recording. Okay, just what uh, I'm picking up on a question. I think it was Mario who came in early on, but just I, I think we just uh, let's make this point. Um, you're the right people to talk to. Mario's asking: Do publishers encourage authors to submit pre-submission inquiries? You've always, always said yes. yes. Yeah. And um, I, I'm just emphasizing the fact that you guys are entirely appropriate people to talk to. Yeah. Um, and it, are, are um, pre submission inquiries worth the trouble? I guess you're just yes. going, yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. That's the whole, that's the whole point of, of, in some cases, to some extent, your roles is to try and smooth that process. So hopefully, Mario, that gives you a clear answer to that question. I'm going to, I'd love to keep this going. I, I always feel frustrated with, with this discussion because there's so much we can discuss. Um, but it's a great, um, it's a great opportunity to hear from you the sorts of things that are happening at the individual companies. It's interesting to hear some of the topics that are, are affecting the publishing business and so on. Um, and I would very much encourage anyone listening to this to contact you via LinkedIn and follow up the discussions and continue the discussions and, and, and so on and so forth. So just for the moment, members of the audience don't rush away because we have only got a couple of minutes. We will carry on for a couple of minutes. But members of the audience, thanks very much. Uh, panelists, thank you very much. Quick wave and um, wish everybody a good luck. Take care.